Talk Business Arkansas is brought to you by the Arkansas Farm Bureau, the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries of Arkansas, the Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas, Noble Strategies, the Arkansas Healthcare Association, and Delta Trust and Bank. I'm Roby Brock. Welcome to today's Talk Business Arkansas update. Some major changes could be coming to the Arkansas Constitution, but first we're going to focus on some changes in Arkansas's business landscape. Here's a rundown. Buckley O'Mell has been named Vice President in Advocacy at the Little Rock Regional Chamber of Commerce. Most recently, he was a commercial real estate broker at Flake & Kelly Commercial of Little Rock. University of Arkansas Chancellor David Gerhart today announced that Chris Wyrick currently the executive director of the Razorback Foundation, will join Gerhardt's senior administrative team as the next vice chancellor for university advancement. The advancement office oversees the university's fundraising, communications, and alumni offices, as well as the university's special events and community relations units. It also has responsibility for the university-affiliated World Trade Center, based in Rogers. A decade ago, Tyson Foods frequently found itself in the headlines and on the front pages for environmental concerns, and not necessarily in a good way. In recent years, the meat giant has instituted a number of new programs and initiatives to correct problems and reverse that trend. Last week, Tyson Foods received an A from a worldwide rating service for its environmental efforts. I sat down with Kevin Igley, Tyson Foods Chief Environmental Health and Safety Officer for a conversation which you can read or listen to on our website at talkbusinessarkansas.com. After this break, what happened at the state capitol today? We'll run through some of the top lines. Also, State Senator Brian King joins me to talk about voter ID laws, very controversial in this legislative session, as well as a recent Medicaid audit that was released. And who knows what else we'll talk about. State Senator Brian King, after this word from our sponsors. I don't think it's going to be an easy conversation uh, because they are very strong-willed. I think it's going to be important to us that we know that you're somewhere in a facility uh, that looks after you, has compassion, has care, and you respect it. I mean, I'd love to look after them. I'd love to be able to take care of them, but I don't think I could. That'd be a wrong choice on my part. Arkansas's skilled nursing and assisted living centers provide quality care for our seniors. Farm Bureau helps protect its members in more ways than you might think. They've always been the voice of agriculture in Arkansas, working on behalf of folks like me when nobody else would. And Farm Bureau stands for the values that Arkansas families care about. They've protected my right to farm and make a living, which helps everybody who likes food on the table. You know what they say, Arkansas counts on agriculture, and agriculture counts on Farm Bureau. The Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries of Arkansas. The State Chamber AIA is the leading voice for business at the state capitol and serves as the primary business advocate on all issues affecting Arkansas employers. Our mission is to promote a pro-business, free enterprise agenda and prevent anti-business legislation, regulations, and rules. Now more than ever, business matters. Learn more at ArkansasStateChamber.com. Drug testing for the unemployed and a host of constitutional changes to Arkansas's constitution. It's what's on the agenda today at the state capitol. A drug testing bill for those receiving unemployment benefits was held up in committee today. Senate Bill 38 by State Senator Jeremy Hutchinson would require drug screening for applicants for unemployment benefits. The bill was delayed in the Senate Public Health Committee for a cost analysis. Today is the last day for filing proposed constitutional amendments. So far, there are nearly two dozen proposals. They include ideas to lengthen term limits, elect highway commissioners, provide voter ID laws, institute tort reform, and to reform the state's ethics measures. And one of those proposals involves voter ID laws. It's from State Senator Brian King of Green Forest. I'm going to sit down with him after this break and talk about that concept, that law, and also things that just came out of last Friday's Medicaid audit report. State Senator Brian King joins me right after this break. 
Noble Strategies is a bipartisan state and federal government affairs firm with a successful track record of providing effective advocacy for business, government, and nonprofit entities. Noble Strategies provides service in areas such as lobbying, public affairs, trade association management, and marketing campaigns. Learn more at noblestrat.com. I was looking for a bank that could best protect my finances. That shared my passion for my business's potential. A bank that offered investment expertise. Linden support. Insurance guidance. A bank that delivered full financial support. That's how I found True Balance. True Balance. From my bank. From my bank. Delta Trust and Bank, the expertise to meet all your financial needs. One of the real advantages of Electric Cooperative's membership is having a voice in our state's energy future. Not a week goes by without important energy issues making headlines. These are issues that need to be discussed. And you should know that as policies are being developed, the cooperatives are looking out for our members, advocating what's best for you. We are your friends and neighbors. We are your local electric company. The Electric Cooperatives. We are, we are, Arkansas. I'm joined now by State Senator Brian King. Good to have you with us. Thank you so Good much for you. being here. Thank you. I almost want to call you Representative King because you're just you're still new in the state. Yeah, Senate. well, you know, when you spend six years down there and then all of a sudden for you know a month and a half you're a senator, you know, it's kind of hard to get out of the representative part. Do you like the Senate a little bit better? You know, than it the House? is a nice transition. I mean, uh, I'm glad to serve in the House and have the experience of of uh, being down here a little bit to go in the Senate. I can't imagine starting off new in the Senate and having to. Uh, tackle a uh, much more bigger district, uh, the, the bigger issues, but, but I do enjoy being in the Senate. And I enjoyed my time in the House, too. It's a little more collegial down in the Senate, too. You don't have as many bodies to have to wrangle for well, votes. They seem to say so. I mean, you know, the sheer numbers of it make it easier. I mean, if you want a controversial bill passed on a, on a committee, you, you only need five votes. Where in the House, you need 11, but you probably really need about 13 or 14. <laughs> And so that's a very tough challenge to do. And I mean, if you need a controversial bill on the House floor, it's 51. On the Senate, it's 18. So the sheer numbers of it make it where you can, you can work better, I think, in just not having the other people. Uh, you know, in the House, they have 41 new members. Uh, so that's a tremendous challenge in itself to try and tackle anything controversial. Well, one thing that may be a little controversial to some people is going to be a voter ID uh, amendment right. that you have proposed. That, uh, I don't think you've got all the details flushed out in it yet in the proposed constitutional amendment, but tell me conceptually what it is that you're trying to, to do. Well, tomorrow we're going to be running the photo ID bill on Thursday that uh, you know just requires a photo ID to vote. I mean, we, we have just some provisions in there that allow uh, for uh, people that you would think wouldn't have a photo ID, such as a nursing home. We also uh, bring some of the uh, absentee ballots. We make it where uh, they can either present a photo ID or they can present a, a water bill or, or, or uh, you know, some type of government document with their address on it. So we're actually gonna be kind of tightening some of the absentee ballot uh, voting requirements. And, and I think that's important because that's where we've seen a tremendous amount of fraud. But the photo ID bill is something that, uh, you know, I've been involved in every session. I uh, give a lot of credit to Dan Greenberg before uh, that helped with that and continues to help. And I think we're going to make some technical changes to it to make sure it's constitutional. From my understanding is the ACLU has publicly said that they're going to challenge in court if we pass this. We think, and as I've talked to our bill attorneys, that, that my bill is constitutional. What do you think is the objection uh, the, on the constitutional grounds? I know there's political arguments against right. it, but let's talk about the constitutional Well, merits. I think you have Amendment 51 that had some requirements for first-time absentee or first-time voters. Uh, so we've allowed some provisions that, that go back that we did, don't get basically on Amendment 51 turf. And so that may be something we have to look at changing later in a constitutional amendment. I also, besides the photo ID bill, have a, a proposed uh, ballot initiative, that constitutional amendment that would uh, put photo ID on the ballot and let the people of Arkansas vote on it. Which way would you rather see it go? Would you rather have the people vote on that vote, voter well, ID or would you rather have it passed through a state law? I, I would rather, I would rather, I guess I would rather have both. I mean, I think that once we pass this out in, the, in this session, which I, I'm hoping to, I uh, think that if, if it's challenging court, that you know, if we put it on the ballot, put it in part of the Constitution, such as what Mississippi did, that it makes it stronger for those few people that continue to say this is a bad thing to do. And 
we've seen Rasmussen polls poll this issue as 75 percent. And you know, in today's you know climate and culture today, to to, to poll 75 percent on the issue is an, is a remarkably strong statement. Let's talk about the politics of it because there are a lot of people that say this discourages some voter turnout, particularly among lower income or minority voters. We've seen some other states where there's been some legal challenges on this. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your argument against that, um, against the merits of that case? Well, and I think that's where uh, Dan Greenberg's done a lot of good research and, and we've seen in other states that's passed photo ID that uh, turnout has actually went up in, in minorities in, in all categories, in, in, in a lot of age groups. Why do you think that is? Well, I think people have more uh, confidence in the election system. I mean, if we look at the, the Hudson Hallam, uh, uh, fraud, theft, that's exactly what he was. He stole an election from somebody that earned it. But he didn't just ex do that, he stole it from the people that selected somebody else. And I think that people see his election fraud as important and, and they want to know, they want to, Democrat or Republican, they want to have integrity in the ballot system. And back to the turnout, I mean, I always say, what part of increased turnout do you not understand? I mean, we're seeing in other states where turnout's going up. Now, Hallam's deal was actually not about presenting a voter ID. It was about um, absentee ballot fraud. That's so it's kind of two separate issues there. There are. And, and there's going to be some things later on after photo ID passes that I feel like is going to make sure or reform Arkansas's elections the way think the structure of the State Board of Election Commissioners, the staff, uh, and how uh, there's going to be some more reforms coming from me that's well, going to address that. Well, now you've tipped your hand and you have to tell me a little bit more well, about what you got in mind. I mean, I think that, uh, number one, we've had a culture here in Arkansas. I mean, Governor Huckabee unfairly got criticized when on Don Imus he said that, you know, this is a banana republic. And he got criticized for it. Well, well he was talking about a elections. Total banana republic. I mean, no, uh, but I mean, you know, we, we do have problems. And, and I've fought election. Uh, irregularities that can't be explained in Carroll County in my own elections. I've uh, fought it as election commissioner, unfair things that were going on by the Democrat election commission there. We knew that uh, in, in situations where they're, they're buying cheap vodka and chicken dinners for votes, we knew that was going on. We've known of uh, election irregularities and things that shouldn't be happening, but we've had a uh, complacent uh, state board election commissioner staff and state board election commissioners, and I plan to change that. One of the things I'm going to do is, is create a voter integrity unit where it operates much like an ethics commission, where if you file a complaint as a candidate, elected official, there's going to be somebody go look into it. Uh, the second thing I've done is I filed a shell bill today that's going to take, I put it on possibly be a constitutional amendment to take election fraud uh, prosecution to an independent judge and prosecutors. In many cases, prosecutors won't go out and prosecute voter right. fraud. Uh, and many times they'll use the excuse that maybe in that community they can't get a conviction even though the person's guilty. Well, we know if there's fraud going on in certain counties that that could affect a U.S. Senator's race, that could affect the whole state of Arkansas. So that's why I feel like it's important to be able to get independent judges and prosecutors to prosecute it and look and see and make sure those people are prosecuted and we stop this. Hudson Hallam's case should have been stopped years ago, period. Well, it sounds like that won't be any controversy with any of that stuff, so well, uh, we'll see where that goes. Let's talk about uh, something else that's been controversial. You're the co-chair of the Legislative Audit Committee, uh, mm -hmm. the Joint Audit Committee. Uh, last week, Medicaid audit report was issued. There was some suggestion before the audit report came out that it was going to show hundreds of millions of dollars of waste, fraud, and abuse in the system. That was tampered down quite a bit in the final report. What's your assessment of the final report from what you've read? Well, I basically, despite the criticism, said the audit staff needs to produce a report. We had two members uh, want to do a special report. The only thing that I've done is made sure, since Medicaid is a big issue, to make sure the, the process was sped up. And we took it from uh, an ordinary timetable of possibly March coming out mm -hmm. to, to, to bringing it up this, you know, earlier because Medicaid's an important issue. Uh, I, I think that the report is just a starting point. I think that we've got into some new area I think with legislative audit right off the bat and member requests because I'll give a lot of credit credit to Senator Sanders and and Representative Westerman for doing a lot of work. I think what you're going to see is there is a problem. I mean, I think you can read the report and say there is. Now, when you take a program that's maybe hundreds of millions of dollars and uh, you know you take that sample size and 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 you extrapolate that out, then you're talking about a considerable amount of money. You and I've talked about this before uh, before we went on camera here. I mean. 
Um, I, I have problems with the sample sizes not being mm -hmm. very big, so I, I kind of see an apples to oranges comparison in taking a small sample size and extrapolating that mm -hmm. across the whole Medicaid program. With that said, though, does that necessarily kill the potential for Medicaid expansion for you in that those things could be cleaned up if you think there are some irregularities or some problems there, but there still is a separate debate to be had about potential expansion. Well, my position is being on the Medicaid expansion is number one, we're going to be relying on the federal government. We know that the federal government, we don't know what's going to happen from budget year. I mean, the, the U.S. Senate hadn't passed a budget for several years up there. I mean, so, you know, to continue to rely on the federal government to the level we do uh, causes concern for me. I mean, the federal deficit problem is not a Congressman Tim Griffin or a Congressman Womack issue. It's, a, it's everybody's issue. Mm -hmm. And even as we continue to get tremendous amount of money from the federal feds and people act like we're getting money from a rich uncle somewhere. And the reality is, you know, we've got to look at, on a statewide level, uh, look at how we can control federal spending because federal government, as we've seen, is in trouble. But that money is going to be out there, at least it's promised to be out there. We've seen some other states with conservative legislatures put poison pill provisions in there that say if the feds don't deliver on the money, the program gets axed. Are you not comfortable with that? Well, once again, you start out there with the federal program, we see where the federal government has is, is went back on promises before, and, and I just am concerned about getting out there with the federal government. I think the people said pretty clearly here in Arkansas when uh, President Obama didn't even get 40 percent of the vote, I believe, that you know they're not crazy about this expanding health care in the government part and I mean I think that reflects on state legislators too. Do you see people in your community though in your district that you think need better health care, more health care, or some better way to address their medical needs? No question but I think that starts with reforming the Medicaid system that we have. I mean we I, I, from what I've seen and even a little bit in this report and I said once again it's a starting point but I think that we need to be reforming our Medicaid program right now today first before we even think about expansion. And yeah, I do see where people need health care, but also see people and individuals that could afford health care that choose not to pay for it. And so, you know, what are we going to do in that situation? There's a company that I know was talking about expanding. They've had opportunities to expand in employees and make more investment. Do you know the number one, they're under the 50 person uh, mm -hmm. threshold. Do you know the number one reason they say that they don't want it, that's the biggest obstacle for keeping from them from expanding the things we want to do to create jobs and the small business, good paying jobs is Obamacare. Hmm. And I think that's a detriment when we set limits out here. You got anything else that you want to throw out there that's well, maybe non-controversial? Well, uh, you know, I think that what alarms me now in the budget process is, is the amount of jobs we see this jobs of authorized unfilled positions with state agencies that have been that way for years. Uh, that concerns me. I mean, uh, when in the committee meeting the other day, uh, Richard Weiss, when I asked him about state job growth over the last six years, he said it's relatively flat. You know, the figures I've seen are, are we've increased 2,000 state jobs. And, you know, while the private sector's hurt. And, and as I always say, government jobs can go up when the private sector's going up. And that's not what's happened. We know the private sector's suffering right now. And so we have a lot of tremendous uh, potential in adding too many employees. And I've said that for years, and hopefully we can start curtailing that. Wild-eyed liberal State Senator Brian King, thanks for being with us. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Brian. He's conservative. Yeah. I'll put him that way. Yeah. I'm Roby Brock. You can catch more business and political breaking news on our website at talkbusinessarkansas.com, and you can catch this full interview and its replay on that website, too. I'll see you tomorrow. Talk Business Arkansas is brought to you by the Arkansas Farm Bureau, the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries of Arkansas, the Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas, Noble Strategies, the Arkansas Healthcare Association, and Delta Trust and Bank.